horror of horrors. His films have influenced countless movie makers. Renowned director George Romero talks about violence on the big screen. Coming up, stay tuned. Thank and you. when we come back, folks, an award-winning film critic and a man famous for giving people a lot to scream about. We'll find out what the director of the Living Dead trilogy, George Romero, has to say about today's horror movies. All right. Okay, Alex, time to go to the movies. And as a lot of you out there obviously already know, the two top movies in the country right now are among the most violent in history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there you see it, and Kill Bill. Has American pop culture grown too violent and is Hollywood to blame? Yeah. Joining us now to talk about it, horror director, well-known horror director, George Romero, the man behind one of the first slasher flicks, Night of the Living Dead. And here in the studio, Steve M. Hunter, Pulitzer Prize-winning film critic for the Washington Post and author of the novel Havana. George, I want to start with you. We can sit here and bemoan uh, all this violence on screen as much as we want, but the first weekend these two flicks were out, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 29.1 million bucks, and Kill Bill, 12.5 million bucks. You're going to, people keep making them as long as people keep going to them, right? I guess that's it. I mean, there's an audience for them, for sure. Well, what is the attraction for all this blood and gore? I, you know, I don't know if it's really the blood and gore. I think, unfortunately, too many films have gone that way just for the sake of doing it. Uh, I think scary movies, things that really sort of get under your skin, uh, are really what people want, those scary moments. And uh, I think that, you know, that's, it's a thrill ride. It's, uh, and it, it, it tells you a little something about, your, about your, yourself. It's, a, it's an involuntary response that, that comes up from somewhere, and you're not sure where. I think we've been telling scary stories to each other ever since we built the first campfire. Stephen Hunter, there have been some studies, I believe, that show that, you know, uh, heavy ODing on violence on television and films does affect behavior of young people. Those who do that tend to be far more violent than those who don't. Do you see any problem from that standpoint of these kinds of films inducing or affecting or suggesting behavior that is totally antisocial? No, I don't. Uh, as a matter of fact, most young people, I see these movies with young people, and most people get that it's a movie. It's not a, a, a design for life. It's not a lecture on how to behave. And they can enjoy the pleasure, the dynamism of the film. These two films and some of George Romero's films are extremely powerful, brilliantly made film documents. And they can enjoy them, and they can have a fabulous, cathartic experience and then they can go back to real life, refresh. And it's, uh, it doesn't seem to me it's necessarily a bad thing at all. Well, let me ask you this. There was a, f a film about 10 years ago, I think, where the kids lay down in the middle of the street and uh, they lay down on their backs right in the median lane and, and they weren't run over, but some kids did it and they were run over. When I was a kid, let me tell you, we went to see Rebel Without a Cause and my brother went out and bought a Mercury just like that. He had the red jacket and the blonde hair and we used to race it down Ocean Highway. So does it, I mean, it, it, when you see what advertising does to influence behavior, it seems hard to me to say that these kinds of things, they can go in there and just blot them out when they leave. Well, Pat, in fact, I'm dressed like uh, Steve McQueen in Bullet as we sit here and But you don't have a so motorcycle. Obviously, <laughs> so obviously it does have some influence. But to me, the point is that these inf when these things happen, they're big stories. They happen infinitesimally. Statistically, they can't even be represented. Yeah, now and then there are extraordinary events, but they're always aberrations. I'm just of the general persuasion that more freedom is always better. And I don't want any institutional body telling artists like Romero and Quentin Tarantino or slugs that they can't do a certain thing because there's a one in seven billion chance that something there'll be some unforeseen evil circumstances I would acknowledge that indeed there will be some unforeseen I won't pretend like it won't happen it does happen the young do crazy things but it's you know I mean it's a price we pay for our freedoms 
Yeah, George, I want to come, come back to you because there's a big difference between Night of the Living Dead or I remember when my kids were little, poltergeist, you know, uh, mm -hmm. taken to that out. I mean, it scared the bejesus out of them, and me, by the way, <laughs> as some of your early films did. But I think you touched on this earlier. There was a suspense there. There was a story there. Um, there was just not the gratuitous violence. Isn't that the difference between the films you made and the films today? Well, uh, <laughs> I like to think that I was using the I was, my intention was to use the violence. That, there are sequences in the three zombie films that I made. I mean, I've made many other films that, that don't have that degree of gore in them, but uh, uh, it was, I used it as a, as a kind of a startle to wake you up, almost like the, the operating room scenes in MASH, which all of a sudden, you know, you're laughing your head off, and all of a sudden okay, you're, you're clock, clocked over the head by the idea that, gee, this is real. Uh, and that's what I was trying to do with those sequences. I much prefer a good, suspenseful, old-fashioned horror film. Well, uh, Poltergeist was, was, without any gore, was, uh, was very, very scary movie. It was. So, well, Psycho, so. Psycho was about as good as they can come, as I recall, back in around 62. But, Steve, let me pick up on your point, sure. which is that uh, the more freedom, the better. Now, I saw a list of the 100 top movies of the 20th century, and something like, se of the top 20, seven were in the 1950s, on the waterfront, Shane, ones like that. Don't some of these films we got now, like Kill Bill and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, isn't there a Gresham's Law where this stuff really drives out good and great art, as it yeah, were, yeah. and kids aren't getting that, they're getting this popcorn for the mind. That's true, however, that's the market. Let's let the market decide. Uh, what has happened with horror films and with extremely violent films is that we go through we go through cycles, and you'll get a breakthrough director like a George Romero or a breakthrough director like a Quentin Tarantino who, make, who finds some new way of doing something new with violence and making it extremely provocative and emotionally shattering and memorable. Then you'll get a cycle of imitators. They're not as good. Their movies aren't as good. They're pretty crummy. That's where you get the kind of gratuitous, ugly violence. Myself, I would prefer, and what happens then, of course, is kids see the first, and then they see the second, but there's a cycle of diminishing returns. You have only to look at the classic slasher movie, which was a big genre in the 80s, and is now either gone or is simply a platform for a parody. Okay. Quentin okay. We're just going to take a break. George Romero, stay with us. Stephen Hunter, we thank you very mm -hmm. much for uh, joining us. You did call Kill Bill pure evil bliss. Thank you. Thanks for defending your point of view. <laughs> when we come back, more violence on the big screen with George Romero and the author of Tales from the Left Coast, James Herson, continuing our discussion on Hollywood and violence, Buchanan and Press on MSNBC. Welcome back to Buchanan and Press. And now who's to blame for violent movies, the directors who make them or the audiences who flock to them? We're back with a legend in his own time, film director George Romero. And also joining us now, uh, James Herson, who's a radio talk show host and author of Tales from the Left Coast. James Herson, let me start with you, and uh, we want to thank you because hi, we understand, hi, we understand that uh, as homework for this appearance, you went out to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So tell us how uh, inspired, inspired you were by it. Well, you know, I, I heard uh, some discussion about the slasher genre, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre doesn't bother me because it's just the same old slasher genre uh, regurgitated, actually, for the third time. But Kill Bill, this yeah. is a different kind of film. I mean, it's devoid of story, meaning, and depth. It celebrates violence. It's, it's short on, on the idea of any kind of uh, meaningful uh, uh, relationship of characters, but long on mayhem and mutilation. I mean, it's enough to make Hannibal Lecter lose his appetite. <laughs> and I'm afraid it may make, uh, create an arms race in Hollywood, or, or maybe a uh, dismembered armed arms right. race. Well, here, here's what bothers me about Kill Bill. It got an R rating instead of an NC-17 rating. Why? Just because there's not enough sex in it? Oh, very clever, actually. Quentin Tarantino took sections of the film and turned it uh, into a sort of black and white film noir. Other sections were Japanese animation in order to avoid the NC-17 rating. Oh. And uh, basically, uh, you have a situation where there's a kind of false labeling on Kill Bill. 
because the uh, mainstream press enablers have labeled this something different than what it is, an exploitation vil uh, film that exploits violence. Uh, here's a film that combines uh, basically the look of a video game, Japanese animation, martial arts. I mean, if you open a candy store, the kids will come. This is what in the law is called an attractive nuisance. This is, right. it, it has all okay. the elements mm -hmm. to draw kids in. Okay. George Romero, let me ask you, you've been, uh, I think, quoted as saying you think these are sort of, uh, kids get sort of a cathartic release that uh, that this diffuses the, the tendency toward violence, them going to this. This is some kind of substitute. Is that right? Well, I think that it can be. Uh, I think that it works, that, that, it, that it does work that way often. Uh, as pornography uh, is, there have been studies that show that, that, it, uh, that it provides some kind of a release and may in fact actually prevent uh, people acting out. Um, I, I think... You mean it has redeeming social value? <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, just because a film is violent doesn't mean that, that, the, that, that uh, it doesn't have redeeming social All value. Right, let I mean, me ask you if any of these films, I mentioned the top 100 films, I think obviously some of Alfred Hitchcock's uh, films, Rear Window, some of those things like yeah. that, were made the top 100. Has any of these violent, really seriously violent films made that list as sort of the real art in, of movies in the 20th century? Uh, well, <laughs> not to toot my horn, but Night of the Living Dead did. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't know that, you know, Night of the Living Dead is not, my zombie films are, haven't been wall-to-wall -wall violence. I, uh, I, however, I will defend somebody's right uh, to, to uh, make well, a film. Well, obviously the right, but is it good? I think that it can be. I, you know, I mean, there, there's not really, I mean, yeah. p what happens is generally people like us sit around and, and express our opinions about it, but there have been, there have been very few real studies done about it. Right. A James? And, uh, you know, I mean, if we really wanted to be serious about it, maybe there is some way to, to uh, program some kind of a study. Mm -hmm. James but Hurston, I want to ask you, uh, read you something that uh, Quentin Tarantino said when uh, Kill Bill opened, all right? And we've already said it's the most violent film ever made. You pointed that out. Here's what he says. Yes. If you're a 12-year-old girl or boy, you must go and see Kill Bill and you will have a damn good time. Boys will have a great time. Girls will have a dose of girl power. If you're a cool parent out there, go take your kids to the movie. I mean, let's be honest, isn't that just sick? It's outrageous, and that's what I, when I refer to the attractive nuisance, that's what I'm talking about. For Quentin Tarantino to recommend this, and by the way, what he said is cool parents, you see? Yeah. And that's the problem here. These things are trendy, like Kill Bill is trendy. I mean, Roger Ebert compared Quentin Tarantino to a virtuoso violinist. Um, another reviewer from the Chicago Tribune, Mark Carroll, said that this was the most gorgeous B-movie ever made. Now, see, that's not truth in labeling. And what these uh, critics are doing is enabling, then, uh, this false presentation. It's really false marketing. I distinguish that from a Hitchcock movie or even a George Romero movie. In other words, when you have a movie in the context of a moral universe where you have explanations for characters' actions, like zombies, but these characters in, Bill, in uh, Kill Bill all they do is celebrate violence for violence sake. George Romero, just a last word. So we're going to see more of these slasher kind of films given the success of Kill Bill? Well, I think given the success of the, of the recent films, I'm sure we'll see more of them. But as was mentioned before, they'll die out and pretty soon uh, people will be parodying them. <laughs> All right. George Romero, <laughs> great to meet you. Good to have you here. James Hurston, thank you much you. for Thanks. joining us. Good to have thank you both. You. Thank you. And coming up, folks, the investigation into how hundreds of illegal immigrants ended up working at Walmart. That investigation may lead right to company headquarters.